So we've asked, been asked to be intimate and um, talk about things we never talk about. But I have to say, I only have one thing on my mind incessantly, and if you speak with me for any length of time, you know what it is. Um, I worry about climate change incessantly and how we can get business, government, and individuals motivated to action. It says time up already. It's like, <laughs> um, so I'm going to do a little bit of background, very depressing, and then we'll move to the positive future ahead. Uh, so I think I can start this. I want to start with a white slide. Um, I've, been, I've, been talking, I've been talking to the senior climatologists, and I'm not a climatologist, I'm an expert in the realm of transportation, so what they tell me, I, want to, I believe, I'm looking to them. And I was speaking with um, John Holdren, Holdren, who is the head of Woods Hole Institute and um, the chairman of the American Academy for the Advancement of Sciences, who's really one of the two senior climatologists in the US. And I was hitting him up and saying, why aren't you saying more? And he wrote me this great email back that said, Robin, I can't get any more high profile or more busy than I am. You know, what are you talking about? And he sent me his 52-page PowerPoint that he had just given to the UN a week and a half ago. When I looked at his 52-page PowerPoint, indeed, slide one says we need to act urgently. And it's embedded in, I want to say, 500 words on that slide. And then there's three more slides with 500 words, and then the 52 other 48 slides of backup. And the, the number that struck me that I was trying to get him to say more overtly, so I'm saying it for him, <laughs> um, the first milestone we need to hit is at what point do worldwide CO2 emissions start going down worldwide? And his answer is, if that happens in 2015, which is seven years from now, we have a 50-50 chance of avoiding cataclysmic effects of climate change. So seven years, we have a 50% chance. Now, those odds aren't ones I really like to play with, so I'd like to you know, can we bring that back a little bit? And so that's what I'm focusing on, is how can we bring that back? Um, this, wait, roll down, roll up. So my realm is transportation, and what's very interesting to me is here's the US CO2 emissions for 2004, and driving our personal cars is 20% of the emissions produced by the US. That's a pretty big chunk. Making those cars and fiddling with the fuel is another 9%. So 29% has to do with our cars. The next largest thing that we as individuals do is 17% um, of the CO2 emissions is our electric bill at our house. And so if you think about what goes into your electricity bill at your house, there are one heck of a lot of things going into that electric bill. So um, I think we need to do everything. And for me personally, what is my highest and best use? It is this piece of transportation. It's the biggest darn thing any one of us do. Let's, let's get at it. So uh, thinking further about this little time frame we have. So I realize this is a little bit of a complicated chart. But if you look at, I put up here, if we start to doing, doing something today, and when will it play out? And it's interesting that in, if we think of what politicians and all of us like to hear is, you know, buy a fuel efficient car, or we're gonna start doing some alternative fuel cars. If everyone started today buying a fuel efficient car when it was time for them to buy a car, in year 10 from now, it'll reduce our demand for fossil fuel by 5%. So those of you who bought your Prius and thinking you're done, you're not done. Um, when we think about city planners, you know, let's build some more walkable and smart communities. Let's you know, put in more trains and more light rail and all this stuff. And we need to do those things. But those are going to be playing out in 10 to 25 years. So the question is, what in heck can we do in this incredibly small window of, I want to say, zero to five years and zero to as few years as possible? And sorry about that. How do I undo that? I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't know how to get rid of that. Um, uh, so, so we can look and see that there are some interesting things that can be done, mostly in urban areas. We can do congestion pricing. It's being talked a lot about in, around the country and around the world, and 
I have lots of opinions about that. I won't talk about it. Market rate pricing, car sharing, I know something about. Telecommuting, making bicycle and pedestrians better. Um, but, OK, I've changed modes. So what we really need to get done is carbon taxes. That's why we need carbon taxes is because I found through Zipcar and for congestion pricing that people change on a dime when money is involved. And that's how we can make things happen in the time frame we need to have happen. And carbon taxes would be applied to uh, utility companies as well as our cars. So it hits both cap and trade, only works for utility plants, does nothing for the transportation sector, which is huge. And if we had these carbon taxes, it would transform our demand for those walkable communities, trains, et cetera, blah, blah, blah. And it would change how I go about my day in a really fast way. Um, so I want you guys all to know, vote for carbon taxes immediately. Uh, so the next um, piece when I think about this is uh, what is the role of business? And so I have my new metaphor, and just to set up my new metaphor is I want you to picture me at age nine weighing a pathetically tiny amount of weight, amount of pounds, and I lived in Jerusalem, and I was sick for about a month in which nothing went in and everything came out, and I was living in Jerusalem, and at the end of this period, you know, I felt like now I was eating again, it was fine, you know, I'm, I'm game, and um, I also say I hated milk. I hadn't, I'd grown up in a place where no one, Milk wasn't an easy thing, and I hadn't drunk milk for, I don't know, five years at the age of eight. Um, so what was, the what was the thing I had to do? I had to take pure iron syrup, yum, and mix it up, stir it up in a glass of milk because calcium helps the absorption of iron, and I had to do this every day for months and months and months. And as a child, that was torture, and of course, I saw no benefit to it. You know, I didn't have any wound I was healing. There was nothing I could look to every day. Was it better? And I feel like carbon taxes and addressing this issue of climate change is that disgusting, horrid medicine that I want to say it's off the table. You have to take it. Done. You know, there's no discussion. But, but my metaphor is this was 1967, and I was living in Jerusalem, and that was the medicine. Like, pretty sucky. If we think about today, what would it be? It'd be in some really charming package, and I'd say, Yahoo, yum. Mom, can I take it five times a day? Can I do it, you know? And that's where I see the role of business. So the role of business is how in heck can we take this horrid medicine and turn it into something that we all want? And so why I'm in transportation, I look back at this graph, and I see there's a big giant gap for people living in suburban and rural areas. The price of cars today consumes 18% of the average American's income which is a heck of a lot, which is why we all weep and wail about gas taxes. But it's going to be going up to about 25% because of fossil fuel prices, increase of congestion pricing, um, parking rates, finally people figured out they need to go up, the carbon taxes, it's only going up. So I look and I think all those people who are living in their car-dependent locations and going to car-dependent destinations, they're screwed. What happens to them? They're feeling extreme pain today and they're going to be feeling in more pain tomorrow so what can we do for them? Um, so here is a picture of Brown, right across the way, Brown and everything else. And so Go Loco, my new company is, let's look at this environment and think, how can I want people to be able to create their own personal public transportation system? And we're gonna do it with my, our cars and our friends and our trips and our expenses. And all of these together are going to create if we think of 1,000 people and a th posting three trips each, we have our own community public transportation system, virtually created out of nothing. Like, how, how amazing. And uh, I'm, I'm very consciously rebranding that, that if we think about carpooling, I have to say that word makes me feel deathly. You know, I feel it's so, oh, five days a week, oh my god, I'm be stuck in that 1950s car with who knows who, like, can't imagine it. And if we think of hitchhiking, a lot of people find that very positive. And other people think, oh my god, it's that stranger axe murderer. Like, you know, I'm not going there. So we need to uh, uh, create a whole new word and concept for this. And let's hope this works. My I first time. Sophomore Listen. year in high school. Oh, it happened all the time. Um, it was um, interesting. No, it was hot. <laughs> it was really hot. And I used to always fall asleep every time I got into it. Because it was fun. <laughs> Four-door sedans, 
eight girls in there. It was a really long trip and we listened to John Legend the whole way up. We thought it was all very fun and we were we knew it was gonna be an adventure. That was that was an interesting trip. Oh it's that in the country. It's too far. Oh, it's too far. Go. <laughs> yeah. <I'm laughs> <confused>. <laughs> So I want you to get the idea that going loco is something new. And uh, so we're built on the Facebook platform, and you can see at the very, very top, it says, hi, Robin, you've saved 449 pounds of CO2. I'm quite proud of that. We'll be starting the one-ton club. Who can get there first? Um, and it, this is arranged around my friends and places I like to go. So this is places I go, and I can see people are, you know, people there's a couple trips to Walden Pond, a couple trips to Ikea, the Rock Gym, um, Kendall Square, and then I can click on another, another tab, which is where my friends are going loco, and so I can choose my friends. Um, a couple things, oops, about things, ways people are using it. This is a track team, a bicycle track team, and they as a club have found that it's vastly easier to organize their trips to the club and back. Um, without people are sharing the rides, the payment is very nice, no one's getting mooched off of more than anyone else. It's been very successful. Um, this guy on the right, he was living at home and he was embarrassed and tired of having his parents drive him everywhere, so he posted a trip, and lo and behold, an old he posted a trip from home to the airport to get back to school, and his um, roommate found and saw the trip and said, I'll take you, and he hadn't seen his roommate in about three years, and he drove him to Newark for free. Um, this guy on the far right, Ed, he wanted, he spied a really interesting conference that he wanted to go to, lecture he wanted to go to outside of Ann Arbor. He didn't have a car, so he sent the lecture announcement to his three friends, and then he sent them his trip posting as a passenger to those three friends, and two of them said, yeah, let's go, and one of them had a car, so they all got to go. Um, here is me. I've had a number of really interesting um, Go Loco experiences. I posted a, I, of course, I'm posting all of my trips. I want you to think that you should be posting the trip gives you half of a halo because you're doing the right thing, you're trying, whether or not someone will match. And um, I, was, I posted a trip to go to Logan because I was flying out of the country and I posted at 11 because I only got my visa at like 10 and, um, and I was driving at 2.30. And lo and behold, my next door neighbor, who I had convinced to be getting email messages from me about GoLoco, she said, my whole family is going to the airport, would you take us? And I thought, like, what was the chance of me normally finding out that my next door neighbor was going to the airport and we could share the ride? So um, I was giving a talk, actually a friend of mine um, at Harvard Business School said that he thought he was a one-trick pony, and I loved this metaphor, one-trick pony. So it turns out this is a donkey, but there I am. <laughs> so my one-trick pony is that I've been, my past company, Zipcar, made very, took, it's making efficient use of the resource. And so with Zipcar, people have their own car that goes, that they drive three out of 24 hours a day. There's an incredibly expensive asset sitting idle all those hours. So thinking of Clay Christensen, so that there was the technology enabler and a business model, and I want to say some, throw in major trends. And so Zipcar was successful. GoLoco is saying, you know what? People are driving their car alone by themselves 86% of the time, and it is this incredibly expensive asset. I didn't tell you. It's $8,000 a year, about 50 cents a mile on average. It is no chump change when you're driving around. So we have this other, let's look at this resource. How can we make it more efficiently used? And other work that I'm not describing is um, how we can make more efficient use of uh, wireless investments that are about to be made in our transportation infrastructure. And I'm looking at that too, you know, how can we make efficient use of those resources? But then I realized I'm actually a two-trick pony. And my second trick is how can I get end users to create the infrastructure? So if we think of Zipcar, I personally have a fleet of 4,000 cars spread across the United States thanks to the fact that the 150,000 or 140,000 other Zipcar members are buying little fractions of cars, and so now they're out there for me all everywhere I want to be in these major cities. Go Loco, we're going to be creating community public transportation networks. You and your personal network has now created this incredible asset. So I am going to close with, after I had about three years into Zipcar, I got 
a, I didn't get, it was sent to info at zipcar.com, a one sentence, just this one sentence that you're gonna see next, email. And for me, it's one of my driving forces behind what I do. And so picture, this was an email sent to, from a customer who'd been a Zipcar user for a couple years, to info at. Have I told you lately that I love you? <laughs> and so I feel that business has this incredible role to play in taking what is this incredibly pressing problem, icky medicine, have to do it, we're doing carbon taxes, if you want better than 50 for 50 odds, and how do we turn that into getting an email that says, have I told you lately that I love you? Thank you.